Hello there, beautiful people. Welcome to another edition of the Weekly Weigh-In. This week, we're going to be talking about why football players are not Iron Man out on the field. time once again. You know that one special Sunday where you, your friends, your colleagues, your co-workers, and your loved ones are all huddled around that giant big screen TV right in the middle of your living room and you're shouting for your favorite team to win like the cavemen and the cavewomen that you are. You're also anticipating the new commercials coming out as well as that halftime show well, you're kind of hoping there might be a wardrobe malfunction, but you know what? We're not really going there. Today we're going to be talking about how football players are taking a risk every time they are going out on the field, and why Super Bowl Sunday is no different than any other game across the country. As we approach this year's event, we have to realize that even though we see our football heroes as gods, and they can run at speeds which would seem like superhuman, that underneath all of that, and underneath all the spectacle that is captured on television, that they are still human. Now, I'm going to take you back to Cottage Grove High School back in the mid-80s, back when I was a junior. And I would walk by Curran Field during the summertime, and I would watch the football players practicing. Now, they would practice in some extreme heated weather, and it always baffled me as to why they never passed out. But then again, times were different, and football, even though it was competitive, was just a game. But sometimes, even in high school football, even today, coaches take the game way too serious. And when they take the game way too serious, it's not the coaches who pay physically, it's their players. And that's never a good thing. From the high school athlete to the NFL pro, there is not one single game where a player is not carried out on a stretcher. And that happens most of the time on both sides, whether it's the defending team or the opposing team. But what I really want to talk about that affects players everywhere are head injuries. Now, as we all know, muscles can snap back into place after they've been relaxing for a little bit, and bones can heal. But the biggest risk when you're playing football is brain injury. This is why helmets are important. Now, a few months ago, two California high school boys were hospitalized after a game, and both boys actually had brain injuries due to playing football. Just after the game, they started acting weird and fatigued, and then afterwards they both collapsed. Now, one of the players, Judson Schwartz, was released from the hospital with a grade 3 concussion and a nerve injury to his neck. All I gotta say to that is, uh, ouch. But Nick Brown, the other player, remains in critical condition due to a high-impact blow to the head that causes subdural brain bleed. Ooh. That's not pretty either. But you know what's even scarier, folks? About 47% of all high school football players are diagnosed with concussions. And most of the time, it's written off as not such a big deal. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, it is a big deal. What they don't consider a big deal is, well, when you get a concussion in high school football, you run the risk of getting Alzheimer's later on in life, your IQ plummets, and sometimes you get suicidal thoughts, which is not a very good thing. But since football is such a competitive sport, some coaches, not all, can be compared to merciless fast food managers who only care about that championship and are less concerned about the safety of their players. There's a high school student by the name of Journey Bailey who told his own story to the Huffington Post after nearly dying due to a brain injury. Here was what he had to say. 
Back when I was on the team roster, our team trainer would issue warnings about the dangers of concussions at the beginning of every season. But I would merely shrug them off because I was convinced that one day I would play in the NFL and the lucrative glamour of the professional athlete life outshine the possible risk of potential brain injuries. But what I didn't realize at the time was that my odds of actually making it to the NFL were next to zero. Statistics on NCAA.org show that only 0.08% of high school football players will make it to the NFL, whereas every single high school football player could suffer some degree of irreversible brain damage. I may not be able to do mental calculations like I used to, but the math on this one is simple enough for even myself to understand. Playing football is a bad gamble. It may not seem like it while you're in it, but it is jeopardizing the things that are the most important to you and your future. Things like being happy, developing critical thinking skills, retaining memories, and all other forms of basic cognitive function that are necessary to maintain your sanity. But not only college and high school football players are being affected by this. Even NFL players are being affected as well. Every week they're playing under the watch of millions of people and that's a hell of a lot of pressure. So when football players are asked if brain injury is actually worth the risk, some will actually say no. As a matter of fact, Mike Ditka was asked if he had a son, would he be allowed to play now? Well, here was what he had to say about that. No, that said, I wouldn't, and my whole life was football. I think the risk is worse than the reward. Dave Dewerson, a defensive back with the Chicago Bears, killed himself in 2011 in his Miami home. Dewerson was part of the legendary 85 team that won the Super Bowl and five years later helped the New York Giants win their own championship. He retired from the NFL in 1993 and started working in business. He had some successes and some failures, but nothing that his family thought would drive him to kill himself. In his suicide note, he described having problems with spelling, blurred vision, short-term memory problems, and issues with putting full concepts and sentences together. He also said that some NFL players may have experienced the same issues due to head injury. Dewerson shot himself in the chest, but in his letter, he requested that his family donate his brain to science so that scientists could understand the connection between concussions and traumatic brain injury. In 2012, Treg Dewerson sued the NFL alleging that the league's handling of Dewerson's on-field concussions led to his brain damage and ultimate suicide. Okay, now we know that football has a risk. And we know it can be dangerous. But we still love it and we still want to play it, right? Well, even if you're an amateur or a professional, there are still some important things that you need to know. Like, for example, when you're playing, keep your head up. Always. Also, if you're a coach, discuss the risk of injury with your players. And when you're playing on the field, keep your head out of contact. That is the most important thing because that will lead to less brain injury. Also, if you're the coach, explain how serious injuries can occur. And if you're a parent and you have a child on your football team, be sure to be involved with the regular meetings with the coach because communication between parents and coaches is key. You also want to clearly explain safe techniques and, most important, provide the best medical care possible just in case you have an oopsie on the field. If you want to read about more tips on how you can stay safe on the football field, I have included those links on my blog on Tumblr, which will be up tomorrow afternoon. In conclusion, if we follow these simple rules for the game that we love, football will not only be safe, it can be enjoyable for not just the spectators, it can also be enjoyable for the coaches and the players as well. Well, that is it for another edition of the Weekly Weigh-In. 
If you want to keep up with my latest tweets, podcasts, videos, or whatever I am doing on the internet these days, you can check it out at my new website at fatmiddleagedginger.weebly.com. Also, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you like it enough to share it, please spread the word to your friends. And if you like what I'm doing on my channel, please hit the subscribe button. Also, tell me what you think in the comment section below because I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, I'm signing off for now, but I will see you guys for Food Porn Friday.